Greetings, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me again. Just double checking. Yes, okay. good evening. Great. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. It's now 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think it's time to officially begin this webinar on strengthening evaluation national capacities. So this webinar is organized by the Sri Lankan Evaluation Association in collaboration with the UNFPA Evaluation Office, Global Evaluation Network, and Center for Evaluation, University of Sri Jayawardenepura University. And this, the theme for this webinar is strengthening national capacities to demand, supply, and use good quality evaluation for national policy making. I will be your moderator, Ana Erika Lareza, Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association. Before we continue, I would just like to give a brief um, uh, reminder for everyone that uh, for our audience, please kindly keep your microphones muted at all times. This is to ensure quality audio from our speakers and that if you have questions for our speakers, just kindly leave them in the chat and we will be reading them later on during the Q&A portion. So, and with that, we'll begin with our opening remarks. Uh, we have Jagat Sene Seneveratne, Vice President of Sri Lanka Evaluation Association. Sir Jagat, I will give you the floor now. Sir Jagat, you're there. Hello, Sir Jagat. Can't hear Jagat. Yes, sir. You now have the floor for the opening remarks. Sir Jagat, I think we can't hear you if you are currently speaking right now. Erika, this is Asel. I think uh, uh, there may be a technical problem. Why don't you proceed with the webinar uh, by welcoming everyone and uh, opening the webinar? Okay. Um, okay. On behalf of on be behalf of Sir Jagat, I would like to welcome everyone on this webinar. Perhaps um, we will have Sir Jagat again later on, but we shall we shall proceed for the agenda for now. So, so for now, our first speaker uh, will be talking about national evaluation capacity development. He is the director for the UNFPA Evaluation Office, Sir Marco Segone. Sir Marco, you can have the floor now. Thank you very much. And uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody and uh, happy new year. Uh, I have a, a PowerPoint, but it looks like it's is not moving so 
perhaps I can do okay I can do it manually uh, can you confirm you can see the PowerPoint on your screen Anna can you confirm you you can see the PowerPoint on on, on your screen yes Marco we could uh, okay. see it perfectly okay thank you very much uh, okay, so once again, uh, thanks a lot to all the organizers and welcome to this webinar on strengthening national, national capacities to demand, uh, supply and use good quality evaluation for national policy making. So in the next uh, 12 minutes, I will mainly cover three aspects. First of all, why national evaluation capacity is important. Second, what do we mean with uh, national evaluation capacities? And third, uh, I will share with you some of the lessons learned uh, that uh, have been learned from uh, all over the world. So first of all, uh, why is so important? As you know, the 2030 Development Agenda uh, that also brings the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, uh, and that were endorsed by 195 heads of states uh, from uh, all over the world in 2015 at the United Nations General Assembly uh, comes with uh, also a, a follow-up and review uh, mechanism. And that's something new because the old Millennium Development Goal did not have uh, this follow-up and review uh, mechanism. And this follow-up and review mechanism uh, says that it should be robust, voluntary, effective, participatory, transparent, and integrated. And also says that it should be country-owned, open, inclusive, and transparent. It should build on existing platform and processes, and therefore avoiding duplications. But also very important to evaluation to national evaluation systems, it says that it should be rigorous and based on evidence, uh, including informed by country-led evaluations. Uh, and, and also in the declaration from the General Assembly, it also says that uh, it also calls for strengthening national evaluation capacities. So for the first time uh, in the international, in the global uh, development arena, uh, there is this call by all the heads of, of, of states from all over the world uh, for this follow-up and review framework. But the second reason is so important just because it makes sense. Just because evaluation is a key component of good governance in uh, any uh, country. Uh, because it promotes accountability to citizens and that's something very important especially for uh, parliamentarians and I'm sure that Honorable Kabir will talk more about that uh, later uh, but also it support the design and implementation of effective evidence-informed national development policies and and last but not least also it help us to learn what works what does not work, for whom, why, and under what circumstances. So it's a key component of good governance for national policies, for national development policies. But the third reason is also that there is a stronger and st stronger demand uh, for a national election system, including by parliamentarians. And once again, I'm sure Honorable Kabir, who has been really the, the global leader for these movements uh, that crystallize around the Global uh, Parliamentarian Forum for Evaluation uh, that was launched in 2015 during the International Year of Evaluation at the Parliament of, uh, of Nepal. And it grew up uh, all over the world, uh, bringing together parliamentarians, once again, from all over the world with other uh, stakeholders, key stakeholders uh, in different national parliaments uh, here in the photos, you, you have uh, the Parliament of the Philippines, the Parliament of uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, the Parliament of Tunisia, etc., etc. So there is a stronger and stronger demand, country-led demand, led also by parliamentarians. So now these are the good news, but uh, if we go back to the follow-up and review mechanism for the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, from 2015 to 2019, last year, uh, we had uh, 153 voluntary national reviews presented uh, at the United Nations uh, in, uh, in New York. And actually, there are even 49 additional voluntary national reviews that will be presented uh, this year in 2020 in July. 
but out of the 153 that have been already presented, only a few of them have been informed by country-led evaluation, by national evaluation systems. Uh, so clearly we, we have a gap, and one of the key gaps, one of the key reasons why uh, 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 evaluation has not really informed voluntary national review as much as we would like, is because uh, we, the, we don't have enough capacities uh, for national evaluation systems. And that's the importance of national evaluation capacities. So this brings me to the second point, that is, what is national evaluation capacities? So in the past, when we talk about capacities, we were mainly referring to individual levels, to the capacities of individuals. So mainly we were talking about training, training of either evaluators, uh, etc. That's clearly a very important aspect and element. Uh, but also we, we were focusing on the supply side of the equation, meaning on the capacity to conduct evaluation, therefore on training for evaluators. And here you have some of the, the, the examples, and that's very important, but we, we realize very soon that training and individual capacities of evaluators only is necessary, but not sufficient. We also need to look at the demand side, meaning the capacities of policymakers, parliamentarians, decision makers to demand for evaluation and also to use evaluation in national policy making. Now, individual level, as I said, is very important, but it's not enough. A second very important level is the institutional levels, because we may have very strong evaluators, we may have very strong individual policy makers demanding for evaluation, but if there is not an institutional environment that is supportive uh, for these evaluations to happen and to be used, uh, that will not happen. Uh, so when it comes to institutional capacities, we mean to institutionalize independence, credibility, and utility. So we need system and procedures, clear system and procedures uh, at country level, exactly to institutionalize independence, credibility, and utility of the evaluation function. We also need a work program and a budget. Uh, so, even if we have a system and procedures, it's very important to have a, a budget to be able to implement the evaluations that have been uh, uh, planned. And then we need also uh, an institutional endorsement of evaluation standards uh, and also inbuilt quality assurance systems. When it comes to evaluation standards, there are a number of evaluation standards. There are the one by the United National Evaluation Group that have been revised in 2016. There are also the revised evaluation uh, criteria uh, from uh, the OECD DAC group that have been just revised last month. But most importantly, uh, several countries or regions have eh? their own localized evaluation standards. Mm. So for, uh, 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 presentation on the news. So, Ange Marius, could you please mute because we can hear you when you talk? Uh, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, to, to be able to institutionalize uh, the evaluation uh, system and mechanism, uh, national evaluation policies are very important because they are the normative framework defining the rationale for the national evaluation system, the purpose and objectives the principles, the definitions, the roles and responsibilities of the different stakeholders, as well as the resources. And, uh, and the, Sri Lanka has been one of the champions uh, in developing national evaluation policies, thanks to the strong leadership of parliamentarians, uh, including, I would say, and led by Honorable Kabir, uh, who will talk just in a few minutes. But if you, policy, national evaluation policy, once again, are needed, are necessary, but are not sufficient. We also need national evaluation system to implement the policies. And for that, we need strong leadership. We need accountability mechanism. We need resources, both human and financial resources, as well as institutional and individual capacities. And the last level is the enabling environment. 
So when we talk about in any enabling environments, we mean an evolution culture in the country. So a set of values and attitudes supportive of evaluative or critical thinking within an organization, within a ministry or within a government. We also need institutional commitment to learning from, a, from evaluation. We also need a protective culture. So remove repercussion on career of, of evaluators so that they can be really independent and, and credible. And we need an understanding of the foundation and principle of monitoring and uh, evaluation. Uh, so, in the, in, so we need a, a systemic approach to capacity development with a public administration committed to manage for results and accountability. So a public administration committed to transparency, to result-based public budgeting, to evidence-based policy making. We need also a strong civil society where rights holders are able to demand for and monitor the quality of public services. And we also need strong national VOPES, the national evaluation associations, like once again is the case of Sleva in, in Sri Lanka, that is one of the uh, historical, let's say, uh, national evaluation associations uh, that uh, go back for a, a, a number of years and have been very active and very strategic in the context, not only of Sri Lanka, but in the context of uh, the entire Asian region and I would say even at the global level. So in a summary, when what we mean about national relation capacities uh, it is really about having a systemic approach to it where we look at the individual capacities, institutional capacities and an enabling environment where we look both at the demand side, the capacity to, uh, to deliver good quality evaluations, as well as the, uh, uh, the supply side. Sorry, the demand side is the capacity to, to demand and use quality evaluation and the supply side, the capacities to deliver good quality evaluation. And very importantly, uh, the national evaluation system should be also gender responsive and equity focused, it should be tailored to the specific context of each country, and it should really led and owned by, by the country. So just to finish my presentation, the how, what has been the five key lessons from around the world in implementing national evaluation system? First of all, uh, is that the evaluation systems should really uh, be uh, led and controlled by the key national stakeholders. And when I say key national stakeholders, I mean obviously the government, but not, not only the government, also the parliamentarian, the civil society, uh, et cetera, et cetera, universities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second key lesson is that the evaluation should be integrated into the national budget and financial planning. Uh, if there is not this strong link, then let's say this strong link will make as an incentive to ensure that evaluative evidence produced by the national evaluation system is, is really used uh, to, uh, for, for the planning of national policies. The third lesson is about work in a coherent manner within existing institutions through coordination structure. So the idea is not to develop new parallel system, but is really to leverage existing system by ensuring also that the, the different mechanisms, for, for example, evaluation system in the different line ministries are coordinated uh, at the national, national level. The fourth is about ensure inclusiveness, but in an intentional manner through a multi-stakeholder engagement plan. Uh, if you recall, one of the key principles of uh, the voluntary national reviews is exactly that they are, should be inclusive, but for that to happen, there should be a clear engagement plan. And last but not least, uh, a national evaluation system should be oriented towards supporting national implementation of public policies, including through implementation of evaluation findings and, and recommendations. So, if you would like more information, uh, I, will, I would like to invite you to download this guide on national action policies for sustainable and equitable development. Uh, it's free of charge in the Eval Partner website that you can see uh, on your screen. And there you will find all the details that I just tried to uh, highlight in this 10 minutes uh, presentation. 
So with this, thank you very much for your for your attention, and I give the floor back to you, uh, uh, Anna Eureka. Thank you so much, Marco. Again, for those who are asking for the slides, kindly check www.epalpartners.org library for any details that Marco presented. Um, before we continue, I would like again to remind everyone um, to kindly mute your mic, please, after if you are not speaking. That would be very helpful in making sure that the quality of our audio for this webinar is ensured. Okay. For the for our next part of our um, webinar, our next speaker is a member of Parliament of Sri Lanka and will be talking about the role of parliamentarians in fostering an enabling environment for evaluation. Please kindly welcome Kabir Hashim. Kabir, you may now take the floor. Uh, thank you, Aina. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to have any slide presentation like my friend Marco, but I'm going to uh, use my voice. I'm going to explain to you what, uh, on this subject. And first of all, uh, good evening. I'm not sure what time it's there. Good morning, good afternoon everybody who's uh, who's joined us today I'm happy to be able to speak after Marco uh, gave a very vivid explanation well um, talking on the subject politicians and parliamentarians that actually never been under so much scrutiny on the spotlight as much as right now because the public is beginning to demand more accountability and transparency uh, in policy uh, uh, decision making. Therefore, it's a challenge to politicians and parliamentarians today to ensure that there is a sense of accountability and transparency. If you take the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development goals, uh, which is a groundbreaking global commitment, the declaration in New York in 2015, I quote, says, we acknowledge also the essential role of national parliaments through the enactment of legislation and adoption of budgets and their role in ensuring accountability for the effective implementation of our commitments, unquote. So it, looks, it shows the seriousness and the importance uh, given to parliament and to the political hierarchy for making effective use of an implementation of uh, yes, Parliament plays this important role for sustainable development and Parliament is instrumental in many ways to support national capacities and the strengthening of national capacities. Now, if you take today's uh, uh, trend, as, as uh, Marco said, there is a, a trend that to use data that is very rigorous and also based on evidence and data which is of very high quality, which is disaggregated, timely, reliable, uh, and it's more focused on uh, people-centered, gender-sensitive, gender so it's very complex, you know, and to get data like this, you need to have one of the most important things is capacity development, which is lacking in most parts of the world. So that is one of the things that has to be addressed for sure. And on the other hand, when you take uh, the whole process, policy making is not as simple as technical decision making. Policy making uh, deals with complex variables and it also uh, uh, deals with competing human needs. Therefore, for the politicians always uh, to make the final decision to be able to evaluate that position between multiple competing needs and social values is itself uh, quite a challenge. So we need to make not only decisions made on evidence, but also decisions that are politically relevant. So this, this, you can imagine how much of technical capacity one would need to look at this, which most political leaders do not have and have not built around them or in their systems. These multiple social concerns need to be addressed. For all this, the national capacity to demand or supply and use quality evaluation must be very high. That's, that goes without saying, there's no doubt about it. But really, has that happened on the ground after many years of using 
evaluation as a tool. In a sense, and who, who has the main, uh, the resources, the powers, uh, and the need to do this. And we believe that Parliament is the one that can really move this. Parliament, because we, we've looked at the demand for the use of um, evaluation, and we found that Parliament uh, has to take a lead role. But to do this, Parliament itself must be well equipped, must be technically equipped, and must have, uh, that is one of the reasons it must be well equipped. Secondly, it must have political champions or political leaders who take the lead to ensure that evaluation is advanced, the cultural evaluation is implemented. Third thing is the Parliament must also work closely for other agencies, the WOPES and the international donors have to work closely with the with Parliament and with politicians. All these international actors in the cause of evaluation have to work closely with the political leaders. This together, the political leadership with a very technically strengthened parliament and other agencies working together can create a very, very fruitful atmosphere or environment to, to go towards our goal. So that is why, in a sense, we, in 2013, we thought about forming the Global Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation. And we started identifying political champions. And today, as a result, in 2015, evaluation was included in the Nepali constitution. In 2015, Tunisia, Tunisia included evaluation in their parliamentary bylaws. And in 2016, Ivory Coast included evaluation in its constitution. In 2017, a new national evaluation policy was uh, adopted in Kenya. In 2014, approval was given for the monitoring and evaluation laws in Kyrgyzstan. And then in 2018, a new evaluation policy was uh, presented in Zimbabwe. In 2017, uh, Afghanistan drafted a new national evaluation policy and submitted it president's office and in Bhutan there was a draft national evaluation policy that was being considered and finalized in 2018 and in Sri Lanka itself in 2018 and then uh, overflowing into 2019 a national evaluation policy paper was approved in principle by cabinet and uh, that gave us the right to go to uh, parliament so that was the beginning so as a result of this movement, the, the Global Parliamentary Forum, where parliamentarians came in, we identified champions. And because of those champions in those parliaments, they moved to legislate, to institutionalize evaluation. Because that was important, because unless it came with constitutional powers and, the, and with the bills approved in parliament, then it gave the teeth to get funding for performance-based budgeting, for evaluation capacity building, and to make it mandatory for evaluation uh, development. So that was what we were first working towards. And in 2018, we were really uh, 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 fortunate that we could organize the Global Parliamentary Forum along with the Sri Lanka Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation together with them, a major global event in the Parliament of Sri Lanka. And the Evel Kalamba 2018 uh, gave the highest government participation it was so seriously attended the president of the country the prime minister of the country and the speaker of parliament they were all in the in the uh eval colombo 2018 and we achieved multiple results as uh, because of this one was that we had 70 parliaments represented at the eval colombo 2018 and then secondly the sri lanka parliament got funding and technical support for capacity building and training of parliament staff through international donors. And we set up an evaluation unit within the parliament of Sri Lanka to enable parliamentarians to get evaluation reports summarized and to be able to use them effectively. Uh, then of course, we had the speaker of parliament appointed a select committee in the Sri Lanka parliament on evaluation under the deputy speaker who is also the chair of the Sri Lanka Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation. So we have a, uh, a select committee on evaluation now looking into uh, drafting a, a national evaluation bill. We have started drafting the national evaluation bill and we shall be presenting it to parliament. So 
because we created champions and we brought people in through parliament and we realized that parliament and politicians have to be engaged in this, we managed to push our agendas forward. And we now find that in most countries, the capacities are being enhanced. And one of the most important achievements in uh, Eval Colombo 2018 was the Colombo Declaration, which is on our website, the Global Parliamentary Forum for Evaluation website. And if you go through the Colombo de uh, Declaration, we have six key points. I'm not going to read all those points because of the lack of time, but if you take Point number three, we very, very clearly say that we understand that parliamentarians as representatives of citizens, custodians of parliamentary oversight, and lawmakers can play a leading role in creating and sustaining an enabling environment for evaluation. So creating that enabling evaluation uh, environment and creating that evaluation culture, as uh, Marco was saying, can be enhanced and supported by parliamentarians and lawmakers getting involved. So uh, the fourth point we said was to create an enabling environment, parliamentarians acknowledge the need to provide guidance, encouragement, and to facilitate the following. One, the establishment of national evaluation policies and systems that consider national context governance structures as well as international norms and standards. Two, the allocation of budgets for the establishment of systems and for carrying out evaluations themselves. Three, the development of technical capacity within parliament and administrative structures to utilize evaluative knowledge as evidence for continuous improvement of development interventions. So that is to have evaluation units and enhance it. Four, the professionalization of evaluation through institu institutionalizing training and developing cadres of professional evaluation, evaluators. So, for example, Sri Lanka, as a result, emanating from this, we've started university diplomas and degrees, and we are training more and more people in the And at ministerial and local government levels, into enhanced capacity development, we've led parliamentary led training programs with the support of the WOPES, or Sri Lanka Evaluation Association. We've been training officials down on the ground. So, that, so we've really practically started using it. So, we acknowledge. Now, with this, that parliaments have have a huge role in this sense. So, I would like to, uh, to wind up to tell you that at this stage there are, of course, issues and challenges. Just because you bring a national evaluation policy it doesn't mean that the system really will work. Or the, the evaluation culture will get disseminated. There's a lot more work to do. We have to create champions from from political level downwards, amongst the public sector, amongst officials, etc. And the WOPES has to play a huge role in this. So in this sense, the wider dissemination of monitoring and evaluation findings continues to be a problem. Monitoring and evaluation institution and planning institutions work sometimes in isolation and sometimes do not have an effective formalized feedback arrangement to integrate lessons into the planning and design of new projects. So this is one of the key problems. So in many cases, donors and partners, uh, partner countries still continue to be more disbursement oriented. And we don't have this country owned systems uh, which are really encouraged. So the lack of demand for monitoring and evaluation and the shortage of professionals multiple result frameworks, too many indicators, lack of aid predictability, weak statistical capacities have been identified as constraints in many developing countries. But whilst recognizing the demand side of the equation, for, uh, creating local demand for evaluation with utilization focus, we must look at the supply side of the equation that includes skills procedures, methodologies, data systems, manuals, etc., that have to be addressed as well. That is why we felt that first parliament has to be upskilled. We have to have technical support in parliament so that parliamentarians will understand what evaluation means, how useful it is. Then they would drive it down because then we, had brought, we would bring legislation in which makes evaluation mandatory. And then the funding gets available, and then it gets driven down to the public sector, to the local government sector, and to the officials. 
So this is what we uh, had focused on, and the need to focus on national evaluation capacity development is very <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Khalil. I, I mean, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Kabir. Um, just, just a gentle reminder for everyone to please kindly mute your mic, and we will be, be now be moving on on the question and answer portion of this webinar. So, if you have any questions, kindly um, place them in the chat, and we will be reading them by that one by one. So for our first question, this is actually from Viviana Lascano and Ibrahim Sanusi. They are actually asking the same question and it would be interesting to hear um, the answers from Marco and Kabir from their perspectives. So how do you get parliamentarians to be interested in evaluations? How do you get governments committed and how do you find political champions? Do you have any concrete examples or experiences that you could perhaps share to the audience? So maybe we, we could start with Marco. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Erika, and thanks to uh, the two colleagues who posed these very interesting questions. I would say that, uh, based on my experience, uh, you know, there is not a, a one blueprint fit for all. So there is not a, a magic formula that can be applied uh, in any country. On the opposite, I think that each country should find its own uh, localized uh, strategy. I'm sure Honorable Kabir can can talk uh, uh, very lengthily on uh, on uh, his experience, not only as a parliamentarian in one country, but also as uh, the chair and the global leader of the Global Parliamentarian Forum for uh, uh, for Evaluation. Uh, from from my side, I think that one of the uh, uh, most, uh, you know, influential uh, strategy would be really to identify national champions uh, who have a, a keen interest in the aspect of uh, evidence-informed policy making, transparency, good governance, etc., and then uh, to to pair them if if, if they don't have a if they need practical uh, examples, let's say, compare them with a similar uh, a situation uh, in parliaments from other countries. So some, somehow what's called the South-South cooperation. So rather than having, you know, the, uh, how to say, the external specialist flying in and saying how it should be done, I think it's much more, much more powerful to match uh, those parliamentarians or those parliaments in different countries who have already struggled with some of the challenges that we are talking about, how to get parliamentary interest, interested, how to get government committed, how to get political champions, etc. So to identify those countries where have already addressed those challenges and share their practical experiences with those countries who would like to, uh, to continue, to, I mean, to start the process or to strengthen the, the process. And here is where, the, for example, the United Nations can play a very important role because the United Nations, like, for example, my own agencies, UNFPA, they are present in all the countries in the world and therefore we can facilitate this kind of South-South uh, exchange. But I would I would like to give the floor to Honorable Kabir. Has as a parliamentarian, he he really has for sure uh, more concrete examples. So uh, over to Kabir. Thank you, Marco. Uh, growing up from Marco, I would also say there is no one fit in this uh, choosing uh, how you choose champions. How do you motivate people to get involved? So one of the things. Uh, is uh, trying to lobby or advocate uh, uh, evaluation it becomes very key. And one of the responsibilities lies with the WOPES that work in that particular country. If those members, if, if there's a strong uh, WOPES 
in the, in a particular country and if they interact with their uh, political leaders and get them engaged and get them to understand evaluation culture they begin to learn how important it is as a tool then it becomes important but today it's become easier because we have a parliamentary forum we have a global parliamentary forum and we are linking all parliaments and we uh, have realized that exposure becomes important and by uh, it takes time in my own experience when i first started in sri lankan parliament to get uh, five parliamentarians to come together with me and talk about evaluation and get them engaged in evaluation activity very difficult but then you have to throw in a character you have to entice people right so you say okay let's do a international conference and uh, uh, please join in for the international conference part of them would just think of a uh, coming on on a, uh, a trip but, you know, when you bring five people at least three of them really think oh this is worth when when they learn it they think oh this is good let's get committed to this so like that we got parliamentarians engaged in different parliaments and we found champions we built champions because i read how it was the minister of health a few years ago who really championed uh, evaluation and to take great lens like that in india in some states the chief ministers were the champions so you had to pick people and then create it so we managed to uh, rope in more and more people by getting them engaged in national conferences in workshops and we had specific workshops of parliamentarians where we explained the need uh, uh, and the importance of not outputs but outcomes which are more important we showed them how it's more important not about how many clinics that have been built but where the citizens health has improved we spoke about not how many schools have been constructed but how many girls and boys are better educated and that you can use data like this when you go to your Uh, constituency and tell people you know because of this project more children are educated better now and that you get the credit right if you, you the only way you can know that is if you can use evaluation as a tool and when when they looked at it they realized that they that that the accountability that their voters are asking for can be delivered by only if you can uh, strengthen evaluation so that way you you convince people so one of the one of the important things was that the, the important things that happened in the uh, last few years the global war and the other thing is that we've managed to work with agencies such as marco and other partners of all to help us to get exposure to parliaments and of course the wopes that has supported us thank you Thank you so much Kabir. Um we would like to ask the administrator if you could kindly please mute the rest of the audience. That would be very helpful. And of course for everyone please kindly mute your mics. That would be also be very helpful. So we will be moving on to our next question. It would be um a question from Lara Sofstad. Um and it is addressed to Marco. Um Lara says greetings from Norway. I am the founder and chair of the Bulgarian Monitoring Evaluation Network and I am especially concerned with the developing evaluation capacity in transition countries. To pinpoint given the criteria listed in your talk Marco, it is perhaps not so surprising that we are lagging seriously behind on achieving this. Given this, what would be a realistic approach in initiating this process? Marco Yeah, thank thank you very much. Um, as I, as I said, I mean, it, it really it really depends on the on the local situations. Uh, now, when it comes to transition countries like in uh, in in East Europe, like in the case in the case of Bulgaria, uh, my my suggestion would be to first of all, you know, if you don't have uh, links uh, within the country. I mean, if you don't have a, a national champions within the countries, etc., uh, my suggestion would be uh, using the the Bulgarian uh, evaluation association to approach 
for example, the European Evaluation Society, who has been working on these uh, issues for a number of years in the European context. Uh, and so you, you, can, uh, you can see with them uh, what kind of uh, experiences they, they could share uh, with, with you. Uh, if you want to, to, to focus more on transition countries, you could also uh, uh, approach uh, the countries, uh, for example, in, uh, in Central Asia, uh, where they, they have also uh, done a lot of progress, uh, for example, in Kyrgyzstan on, on these on this aspects. Or if you would like to look more at the south, you can approach the Balkan evaluation associations, uh, where they, they've been also uh, working, working on this. So mainly two, two uh, pieces of advice. The first, the first is to, to try to uh, identify some champions in your own countries. Uh, and the second uh, is to, to, to try also to partners uh, with uh, either associations or parliamentarians, etc., in uh, neighboring countries or in countries that have a similar uh, political and historical and cultural context uh, so that they can also uh, support you. So that would be my two pieces of, uh, of uh, advice. Thank you, Marco. And again, a reminder, kindly mute your mics. And for further questions, kindly leave them in the chat and I will be taking note of them. Uh, for our next question, perhaps Kabir would be interested to answering this one. It's a question from Sokanath. Um, and his question is, what kind of strategies can be used to follow up after capacity building? So, Kabir, what do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Capacity building is just part of the uh, problem. When you uh, follow up on capacity building, it's not as, uh, as important is to create the evaluation culture because you, can, you have two things. One is to have the leg uh, necessary legislative uh, mandate through constitution of the country to bring a bill to parliament and to ensure that um, evaluation becomes mandatory and then only when that happens the government institutions really follow up on it but even if you say it's mandatory and you do capacity building it becomes very important to enhance the culture uh, of evaluation to get people officials to be uh, to interact with the war pairs to understand the importance of uh, evaluation, that evaluation is not uh, purely an audit and not to audit their work, but it's more than that, uh, to make them feel at ease. And, and one of the important things is to be able to understand about attributes. It's very important uh, from, uh, because it's very important for measuring performance in ministries and departments. And uh, the other thing is to ensure that the, the kind of a reward scheme for people, is, if this has been something that's worked for uh, departments where evaluation has been implemented effectively, there's been always a reward scheme for officials and that has made more and more people uh, uh, implement work better on on evaluation itself. So there are many other things that has to go along with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Kabir. Our next question is addressed to Marco. Question, the question is from Zakarie Harvey, who is working for the Ministry of Planning, Investment, and Economic Development. Um, and is the head for evaluation and research. So the question is, um, they have a national po m and &E policy in place, which cabinet has passed in 2018 July. What they are lacking on is individual capacity and institutional capacity to improve their knowledge in evaluation. How best can they get involved in participating? 
how could they best be involved in participating conferences, seminars, and workshops to improve their knowledge and evaluation? How can they integrate institutions who support capacity building in countries like Somalia? Since they have they don't have evaluation associations to support them. What do you think, Marco? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, the very interesting question. Uh, so in, in cases, so if I understand well, this, this uh, question is coming from uh, actually from Somalia. Uh, so in cases uh, of countries uh, where you don't have, a, for example, a, a national evaluation association, uh, my, my suggestion would be also to try to approach, for example, the United Nations agencies uh, in your countries, uh, for example, UNDP or UNICEF or UNFPA, uh, who are active in this aspect of uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation, in this aspect of uh, uh, transparency and, and accountability, and, and to see with them uh, and to try to advocate with them uh, about the possibility or the opportunity uh, to support uh, strengthening national evaluation capacities, including individual and institutional capacities. Now, the fact that you already have a, a national monitoring evaluation policy is already a big uh, a step forward, and you should somehow facilitate uh, the support in strengthening uh, a national system as you already have uh, a normative framework that is supporting uh, that system. The second, the second way would be to to uh, to approach uh, Afrea, that is the African Evaluation Association, uh, that can also uh, try to to facilitate uh, the participation of uh, uh, individual leaders or champions or evaluators to, for example, the African Evaluation Association uh, uh, conference that usually brings together. Uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, key participants from uh, all over Africa. And so that would be a great opportunity to both to learn from the experience of other African countries, but also to contribute uh, to the African knowledge on evaluation with your own national experience. So those will be my two uh, suggestions in, uh, in your case. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. Perhaps we have one more um, one more question that I could we could um, get into. And one question would be from Molumba, and I think it this would be best addressed to um, Kabir. Um, and his question says, there is a tendency by budget support donor to set up parallel M&E systems, which often creates more fatigue on already capacity constrained ministry and agencies in pro providing data. Is there an experience where such have occurred and how did you mitigate it? Kabir? Sorry, uh, Anna, can you repeat the question again? Okay, um, the question is, there is a tendency by budget support donors to set up parallel M&E systems, which often creates more fatigue on already capacity constrained ministry and agencies in providing data. Is there an experience where such have occurred? And in, in that experience, how did you mitigate such? Uh, yeah, this is this is uh, what uh, I uh, addressed when I was speaking earlier, saying that still uh, lots of uh, countries sometimes have to deal with you know donor requests and disbursement-driven uh, uh, evaluations, and as a result, it's it's not uh, country-owned most often, and that's one of the issues. On the other hand problem is uh, country itself sometimes does not have the capacity and therefore sometimes donors have to have their own agenda. So it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's like the uh, case of whether the cart before the horse kind of case. So you need to 
parallelly work on this whilst you're getting support from uh, donor-driven evaluations. You need to move away from it. And that is why internal capacity building becomes important. But in most countries, internal capacity building is a problem because of the lack of resources and uh, lack of expertise. We had this problem in Sri Lanka and then uh, we did not have a diploma or a degree program until recently. A uh, few years ago, we decided that we, if we are going to build capacity, we need to first get, uh, you know, uh, have the expertise within the country. So we, we got support, like Marco said, from international agencies, uh, from different groups, and we built our capacity, our expertise, and then now, now it's slowly now to provide that expand the culture of evaluation. We are trying to get more and more people involved in uh, getting professionally qualified in evaluation through diplomas and degrees. And we are also the WOPES Slava Sri Lanka Evaluation Association is having more and more workshops for uh, local uh, level officials for them to participate, giving incentives for them to participate so that they get trained. And that, in that way, the, the local capacity is quietly getting built up. And we are still not in a point where we can, you know, go it alone. But we believe then there will be a point where uh, all evaluations, whether they are donor-driven or not, can be country-owned, country-led. So this is a, a process that has to evolve. There's no quick fix, I think. And I do believe that you need to, it's, it's also uh, the government's role to ensure that, uh, that if, they, if the parliament takes ownership to make sure that all evaluations are country driven and to have that standard setting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kabir. And with that, we're gonna end our question and answer portion. Moving on with the agenda, um, we have for our closing remarks, the chair for the Global Evil Youth Network, Khalil Bitar. Khalil, you now have the floor. Thank you, Anna Erika, for the great facilitation of the very interactive webinar with many really excellent questions. And thanks also to Mr. Marco Sigoni and Honorable uh, Kabir Hashim for insightful talks and presentations. They both bring a wealth of experience in the topic uh, we are discussing today, but often they are also leaders actually in, in this movement of building capacity building. And we are lucky all to have them uh, today with us. I also want to thank Sliva, the Sri Lanka Association for organizing the webinar and Ibal Youth was proud and is proud to partner on such a topic that is relevant to young evaluators, but also to senior evaluators, actually to evaluators everywhere. And in the main takeaways, I think from the, the important webinar, where for me at least how I, I heard it, the, the role of evaluators, whether in capacity building for evaluation, individual or institutional, the political champions, especially parliament, evaluation culture and importance of in considering equity uh, focused issues. Evaluators role is, is very important in all these uh, milestones and important uh, development in each countries. We cannot wait for champions outside the evaluation activism basically or, or being in evaluation associations to come and be champions. We have to build alliances in each countries. And perhaps finally, we'll end on really two excellent points. I think that they're very relevant and very important and on the spot that context matters in each country. And there's no quick fix. And both um, Honorable Kapir and Mr. Marco have highlighted this. Um, and we see in different countries where, where important work has been done on evaluation capacity building for National Evaluation Association and all the rest of important development in this side that it takes time it does not happen overnight but i'm hoping 
that as evaluators and also our natural uh, alliance alliances with parliamentarians as well is to look back at the best decade of the first, of the 21st century with its success but also failures in terms of you know development results equitable societies and environmental sustainability and look what we can do differently to build stronger evaluation culture that is not only spoken among evaluators but also communicated within you know different circles in in any country with that i end you know my contribution but thank you so much for a great webinar and we look forward for more webinars on on the topic and other topic that's relevant to all evaluators thank you Thank you so much, Khalil. And with that, this webinar is officially closed. Many thanks to everyone who have joined us here with today. Thank you to Honorable Kabir and to Marco for sharing your knowledge and experience. And of course, to the organizers of this event. For further questions and inquiries, you may send them to sleva.sec at gmail.com. That's S-L-E-V-A dot S-E-C at gmail.com.